In the distinct clinical syndromes, these include uh, bacterial meningitis, viral encephalitis, brain abscess, and infectious form of lebitostatus, involvement of the uh, veins or of the pure venous sinuses of the brain secondary to some parameningeal infectious process like mastoiditis, like otitis media. A spinal cord, it can be epidural abscess and sometimes there is infectious myelitis. Myelitis is mostly inflammatory or either it is post-infectious but in rare cases it can even be due to infectious cause. Okay. So now how to classify brain involvement in sinus infection? It is classified on the basis of the part and type of involvement. First is meningitis, which is predominant involvement of the meninges of the brain. And then is encephalitis, which is primarily involving brain parenchyma. Then we have meningoencephalitis, which is a combination of meningitis and encephalitis. Then there is brain abscess, which is focal infection with a surrounding capsule formation. And cerebritis is a focal infection without a surrounding capsule. And cerebritis is the initial state of brain abscess. The causes of meningitis can be divided into infectious and non-infectious. Infectious causes, we have viral and lots of viruses which cause uh, meningitis and encephalitis. We have bacteria. Uh, causing acute bacterial meningitis and mycobacteria, brucella and fungal which cause chronic meningitis and non-infectious causes we have aseptic uh, meningitis viral which can cause by many viruses and some drugs and malignancy is also one of the non-infectious causes of meningitis and which we call as carcinomatous meningitis. The sign and symptom of all these simulate and then we have sarcoidosis in one of the causes and rashes disease and connective tissue disorder there is SAD. Now coming to acute bacterial meningitis, it is actually an acute virulent infection in the subarachnoid space. Frequently the subarachnoid space and parenchyma are simultaneously involved and the organism which commonly cause meningitis includes Staphylococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitis, and group B Streptococci and Listeria monocytogenic. Listeria we consider more in infants and in older adults more than 50 years of age and immunocompromised and in pregnant women. And uh, predisposing factors to streptococcus pneumonia include pneumococcal pneumonia, pneumococcal sinusitis or otitis media, alcoholism, diabetes, splenectomy, uh, sorry for the spelling error, hypogamma globulinemia, complement deficiency, head trauma with basal skull fracture. The pathogenesis of meningitis involves, may involve hemangiotensis spreading from a primary source and from the parameningeal structure like sinusitis or mastoiditis or otitis media, then it carries either the direct infection of the subarachnoid space due to fracture base of the skull from any dermal sinus tract and from a ruptured meningeal seal abscess. And direct infection can occur in those patients who are undergoing neurosurgical procedures and lumbar punctures. That is one of the hydrogenic complications of lumbar puncture. And cranial nerve and peripheral nerve like rabies encephalitis and in herpes simplex encephalitis. Now hematogenous spread, uh, as I told you earlier, it can occur in patients who have pneumococcal pneumonia and as a complication, they can develop meningitis. Clinical features, they may present as a fulminant infection or they may worsen progressively over several days. And the classical clinical triad is a fever, headache, and neck rigidity. And it is not found in every patient. And it can be found in about 70-75% of the patient. And the rest of the patients may have two symptoms among these. Decreased level of consciousness ranging from lethargy to coma and uh, patient of meningitis can be fully conscious but lethargic. It's not necessary that patient should be having altered level of consciousness or altered mental status of coma to label anyone as a, pa as a patient of meningitis. Nausea, vomiting and photophobia, these are common complaints. 
and there can be focal or generalized seizures and in about 30 percent of the adult patients meningitis can cause seizures and it is more common in infants and children on clinical examination uh, you may find rash of meningococcemia if the patient uh, has uh, meningococcal meningitis there may be decreased level of consciousness signs of meningit irritations can be present like neck stiffness vision skin turning sign signs of raised icp can be present which include reduced level of consciousness papilledema dilated poorly reactive pupils six nerve palsies unilateral or bilateral maybe decerebrate posturing and the pushing reflex that is bradycardia and hypertension so these are the clinical findings which you can find in a patient with meningitis and uh, this is a pictorial depiction mm, severe headache stiffness dislike of bright lights that is photophobia fever vomiting drowsy and less responsive and rash which can develop anywhere on the body either extremities or on the trunk as well the investigations in the patient we need to get the baseline labs which includes cbc urea creatinine electrolyte esr and cdf protein uh, we should get blood cultures done which are positive in 40 percent of patients with meningitis and just x-ray can help as i told you it can be a complication of pneumonia CT head, now I'll explain in which patients we need CT head, the CT brain and CSF analysis which include CSF PR as well as the culture and sensitivity and gram staining. And you have to be careful and increase ICP, it may increase the risk of herniation and there should not be cellulitis at the area of lumbar puncture and bleeding disorder. Uh, these are um, sort of uh, relative contraindications for your lumbar puncture. The diagnosis is based on CSF analysis. There would be an increased opening pressure and glucose will be decreased in less than 40 or you can say less than two thirds of the plasma glucose because in diabetics this formula may not apply as they have high blood sugars. And polymorphonuclear leukocytosis that is neutrophilic leukocytosis more than 100 cells per microliter and it can be in thousands cells can be in thousand and when you find in some patient if the count is more than 50,000 you can suspect that there is a ruptured brain abscess because this high count usually is not found in simple uncomplicated bacterial meningitis. Increased protein concentration it is more than 45 and culture positive in 80% of the cases and brain stain is positive in 60% of the patients. Now, what are the indications of lumbar puncture before you proceed for LPN? These are the, uh, the guidelines or the indications by Infectious Diseases Society of America. And they, uh, just to avoid the unnecessary delay in the diagnosis, they have uh, uh, formulated some criteria for ordering a brain CT prior to LP. Number one, in those patients who are immunocompromised state, like uh, HIV positive patient or those who are receiving some sort of immunosuppressive therapy, either the steroids or some other immunosuppressive drugs or after the organ transplantation. Uh, any history of CNS disease, like uh, history of brain tumor, a stroke, or any focal infection, new onset seizure within one week of presentation, papilledema, abnormal level of consciousness, any level of TCS below 15 and any focal neurological deficit. Uh, you should understand what uh, I mean by focal neurological deficit that is when you find any focal signs on examination like any motor deficit or any cranial nerve uh, palsies or extensor plantar these are focal neurological deficits. And you should be familiar with this term because this is very frequently used. Now the diagnosis uh, again what if you your patient has a VP shunt. The infection rate is 2.6 to 10 percent mostly in first few months after the VP shunt placement that is ventricular peritoneal shunt mostly infected by skin flora that is a staph aureus, coagulose negative staph or propionobacterium, needle aspirate the reservoir that is 25 percent better than LP at identifying the pathogen and this procedure is done by the neurosurgeon. 
Now we will uh, compare the CSF in viral and bacterial uh, TNS infections. Opening pressure in viral infections of TNS, it can be normal or it can be raised. In bacterial, it is usually raised, but it may be normal in some cases. Appearance is turbid in bacterial meningitis. And WBC count has polymorphonuclear leukocytosis in bacterial meningitis and lymphocytic uh, dominance in viral infections. Proteins are raised in both, more so in bacterial. CSF sugars, usually normal in uh, viral involvement of CNS, but in some viruses, there you may find low glucose, uh, for example, like herpes encephalitis. The CSF sugar can be normal and it can even be low. And in bacterial meningitis, it is definitely low. In others, there are special uh, labs that we perform, like we can send HSV RNA if we are suspecting herpes encephalitis. And in bacterial meningitis suspected, we can send brand stain and culture insensitivity. Now, the management first of all, uh, the basic management you have to assess the ABC, that is a primary rule for each and every medical emergency. And you have to assess for airway breathing secretion, to check the vitals, you have to check the blood sugars, and you send all the baseline labs. And mostly these patients, they need ICU care until and unless they stabilize. And the management, basically, the specific management, that is the drugs which we use are the, the third generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxone and ceftazidine and IV vancomycin. This combination, this is the empirical therapy for suspected acute bacterial meningitis until and unless your culture and sensitivity report is there. And it is continued for 10 to 14 days. And in between, if the culture and sensitivity is showing that the organism is resistant to these drugs, you can always change the therapy according to the culture report. You need to add ampicillin to cover listeria in less than three months. Older babies, more than 50 years old adults, pregnant women, and also in immunocompromised people. You need to do pretreatment with IV steroids before the first dose of antibiotic. 15 to 20 minutes before that, you need to inject about 10 milligram of dexamethasone, and then they're inserted certain dosage. You need to continue for at least two to four days. And this basically reduces the inflammation and prevents the adhesions and some other complications. You need to reduce raised intracranial pressure because this is one of the complications of meningitis. And you need to uh, reduce raised ICP with various measures. Like there are certain factors which can uh, raise the ICP and which are correctable, like hypoxia, like hyperthermia and you should lift the head end of the bed and what else uh, fever hypoxia hypercarbia hyperthermia these can all lead to raise icp yes and straining straining like if the patient is constipated and he is strains at passing the stool then it can also raise the icp you can add a simple laxative uh, at night and then we have a specific measure for raising icp just like I told you, steroids can help in reducing ICP in these patients. And we can use mentol to reduce ICP. And sometimes even 3% saline is used in some patient to reduce the ICP. And then we have uh, another meningococcal meningitis. That is a common organism for meningitis. It causes fulminant. It can cause fulminant uh, meningococcemia with pituric rashes and with overwhelming sepsis and DIC and adrenal hemorrhage as a complication. It can cause simple meningitis with rash. It can cause meningitis without rash. And the mortality is 3 to 10%. Here you can see a rash uh, on the extremity as well as on the trunk. And this is... Again, uh, hyperic rash, necrotizing rash on uh, around the lips and on the chin of this patient. And the treatment and chemo prophylaxis. And if any any patient you are suspecting meningococcal meningitis, droplet precautions should be observed for 48 hours post antibiotic. 
I hope you are well aware of proper precautions. And then treatment comes uh, as far as the pharmacological treatment or specific drugs that we use. We can use either ceftriaxone or penicillin G. Nowadays, ceftriaxone is widely used. And we need to eradicate the nasopharyngeal carriers in household close contact. And the healthcare providers, the doctors, or the nurses who have examined the patient closely, and the need profile axis, that is rifampicin 600 mg for two days, or ciprofloxacin 500 mg once only, or septagon 125 mg IM once. We need to give this profile axis to those who are close contacts of your patient and those healthcare workers who have attended him closely. The complication of meningitis, patients can develop hydrocephalus, that is increased accumulation of CSF and dilatation of ventricles and it will further aggravate the intracranial pressure. And then patient can have seizures and they can even develop the status epilepticus. We need to uh, control the seizures with anti-epileptic and we also need to rule out secondary causes of seizures like electrolyte imbalance, hyponatremia. In diabetic patients, maybe hypoglycemia and in uh, adrenal uh, hemorrhage, which is a complication of uh, meningococcemia, and it can also cause hypoglycemia and secondary seizures due to hypoglycemia. Shock can occur in adrenal hemorrhage. SIRDH syndrome of uh, inappropriate adrenal secretion again, hyponatremia. Then uh, it can lead to subdural effusion and subdural empyema. In subdural effusions and empyema, these need, usually need the neurosurgical intervention in Greenwich along with the antibiotics. Meningitis can cause septic sinus or cortical vein thrombosis. This is secondary involvement of the dural venous sinuses or the cortical veins and it can cause thrombosis of these and it can cause further complication like raise ICP, seizure, hemorrhagic infarctions so, and again we have arterial ischemia, meningitis can, can lead to arthritis or arterial ischemia causing infarction or inflammatory vasculitis and stroke in various uh, areas of the brain. It can cause cranial nerve palsies, especially deafness that is the vestibular cochlear involvement is common with acute bacterial meningitis. Then comes septic shock or multi-organ failure from bacteremia and especially more with meningococcus and pneumococcus. And the last is adrenal hemorrhage with hypoadrenalism which is known as white water house radiation syndrome. It is secondary to meningococcemia and adrenal hemorrhage in patients that present with shock and uh, hypotension, low blood sugars. And this is the presentation. And you need to give a steroids in these patients and they may need a, they usually need long-term maintenance because of adrenal hemorrhage. Then comes aseptic meningitis. Aseptic meningitis is caused by various viruses and it is also caused by some drugs like non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, lamotrigine, even the IV immunoglobulin which is used for GBS and various other neurological disorders. Aseptic meningitis is typically present as fever and mucous rigidity and it may have headache, nausea and vomiting. And these patients, uh, they don't have, usually have altered level of consciousness and it is basically an inflammatory response. This is not a direct infection of the meninges but I just wanted to explain this as well because this term is used uh, quite often in, in regard to viral and uh, other infections of the CNS. And CSF may show increased WBCs, that is the mild lymphocytic pleocytosis, normal to slightly elevated protein, there would be normal gram stain, the culture will be negative, the viral serology will be negative. Patients, uh, mostly they are uh, alert and they, are, they don't have altered level of consciousness, but signs of meningitis can be present and fever also can be present and headache and other uh, like nausea, vomiting, headache. Management is usually supportive. So we need to relieve the headache, we need to relieve the fever with antipyretics and if the patient is dehydrated, we need to hydrate him. And sometimes what happens that if there are pus cells on the gram stand, mostly the clinician they will start on empiric antibiotics until and unless they uh, receive the report of culture insensitivity. So when the culture insensitivity is to a new organism, then uh, we think that this is aseptic meningitis and not uh, bacterial meningitis.
Sometimes what happens that it becomes very difficult to rule out encephalitis in this patient because sometimes, sometimes aseptic meningitis patient, they may be in a state of confusion. They may uh, have little bit low ECS like 13 or 14 and especially in those cases sometimes we empirically treat them with antiviral as well because there is no test which is 100% sensitive to diagnose uh, herpes encephalitis. So to save a life we give empirical treatment and sometimes when we are sure about few investigations and assessing the patient we can even stop that. So this is aseptic meningitis. Now comes viral encephalitis. Now encephalitis is uh, basically involvement of the brain parenchyma that is. Uh, brain parenchyma. And the next is meningoencephalitis. When the meninges are also involved along with the brain parenchyma, it is called meningoencephalitis. So encephalitis is basically two clinical presentation, either simple encephalitis or it is meningoencephalitis that is in combination with uh, meningitis plus encephalitis. It, the difference is that patient will have signs of meningitis irritations as well, which are usually not found in isolated encephalitis. Now this is etiology of viral encephalitis. There are so many viruses which can cause encephalitis. On top you can see herpes simplex virus and then we have other herpes viruses like varicella zoster, Cytomegalo especially in the immunocompromised patient and then we have influenza, even enteroviruses like polioviruses and measles, mumps, these can also cause encephalitis, rabies encephalitis we are all aware of, then arboviruses for example Japanese encephalitis, just uh, Japanese encephalitis it is, it is uh, causing encephalitis in Southeast Asian countries and it has certain peculiar feature like patient they may have abnormal movements and they may have uh, MRI signals in the basal ganglia uh, not like herpes encephalitis, herpes encephalitis patients they have MRI abnormalities from basically in the temporal lobes while in Japanese encephalitis basal ganglia are mostly uh, showing abnormalities when we do the imaging. Now the other encephalitis like St. Louis and this Venezuelan and equine encephalitis these are not found in South Asian countries these are found in other various parts of the world and then we have arena and rio and lots of other viruses the clinical features of patients with encephalitis include fever headache vomiting that is common to meningitis and encephalitis both reduced level of consciousness more common with encephalitis and then with meningitis but it can occur in both confusion of behavioral abnormalities like agitation hallucinations, memory problems and they may have other symptoms like aphasia, ataxia, sometimes cranial deficit but again cranial deficit are not very common with encephalitis but these are more with uh, chronic uh, meningitis like TB meningitis and cranial nerve deficits uh, if the patient has raised ICP you may get false localizing sign of unilateral or bilateral sectional palsy that is again more common with bacterial meningitis and involuntary movements like coriform movements or chorioacetoid movements as I told you earlier more common with Japanese encephalitis. The diagnosis is basically done on CSF analysis and in CSF analysis we get either normal glucose most of the time or as I told you some viruses may uh, have decreased CSF glucose like herpes and mumps virus is one of them. Elevated proteins more than 50 milligram percent lymphocytic pleocytosis would be there and uh, it may be 100 or more than 100 and up to 500 usually mostly and we can check the viral PCR, viral RNA in the CSF through PCR that is HSV RNA we can order when we are sending the CSF studies and we are suspecting viral encephalitis neuroimaging either CT and more likely MRI it may show focal lesion especially in the temporal lobes these are usually bilateral and asymmetrical uh, signal abnormalities, T2 signal abnormalities in the temporal lobe. As you can see here, this patient has bilateral asymmetrical temporal lobe uh, high T2 hyperintense intense signal more on the right side and less on the left. And this patient again has unilateral temporal lobe T2 hyperintense intense signals.
Now in EEG, you may get periodic lateralized epileptic discharges. This EEG, you can see there are bilateral temporal lobe signal in this is of a male who is 37 years old. And this is longitudinal montage of uh, the EEG and these are plaids which are occurring every 1.5 seconds. As you can see, this, this and this again, sorry. And you can see in MRI and flare coronal image hyperintense signal in the mesial temporal structures in solar region, this one, and also in the supraorbital inferior frontal and cingulate caris, which are not shown here. In this picture, you can appreciate only the temporal lobe signals and also in the insular cortex. Okay, so these abnormalities are hyperintense of D2 and flare images. And CT MMS, these abnormalities. Now, the management, again, in every patient, ABC is first. Checking the blood sugars, airway, breathing, circulation, assessing the vitals, and uh, looking for the signs of dehydration and raise ICP. Then you have to start with the specific management. In the specific management, many viruses only need the supportive uh, therapy, like acyclovir that we use. The IV acyclovir is basically more for specific for herpes simplex encephalitis and very severe encephalitis. It doesn't work for the eco and arboviruses and all, but we empirically treat this patient assuming that they have herpes encephalitis as I told you. None of the test is 100% sensitive. Even the CSF HSV PCR is not 100% sensitive. The MRI is not 100% sensitive and even the EEG. All three tests may be normal in a patient especially in the first few days of the symptoms. So, uh, in many patients, we have to empirically treat them with IV acyclovir. If the CSF especially is showing the um, viral picture and it is not consistent with acute bacterial meningitis, and sometimes even your CSF may be normal, but the patient will be having all the signs and symptoms. In the initial 24 to 48 hours, they may have a normal CSF, but mostly these patients have abnormal CSF with the viral picture that is near normal glucose or slightly low glucose and lymphocytic predominance, raised proteins. And we can give anti epileptics for seizures, and these patient seizures are common with viral encephalitis. And measures to reduce raised ICP, these are same. We have to prevent those factors which can lead to raised ICP, and we have to reduce the ICP with specific. Um, pharmacological treatment like Manitor and sometimes 3% saline. Uh, now comes brain abscess and uh, cerebritis. Abscess is basically focal separative infection of brain parenchyma with a vascularized capsule and cerebritis is initial stage of brain abscess when the capsule has not started forming. It's a non-capsulated focal parenchymal infection. Common etiologies include direct spread from a contagious uh, cranial site like uh, paramenangeal sources, sinuses, otitis media, and mastoiditis, and following the head trauma or neurosurgical procedures, and hematogenous spread from a, spread from a distant site like infective endocarditis, like a lung abscess. I'm sorry, just uh, forgive me for these spelling mistakes, just few spelling mistakes are there. Okay, so this was about the etiology of the brain abscess. And then we have clinical features of brain abscess. These include mostly headache, fever, and focal neurological deficit. Fever, mm, headache, and what is missing here? Signs of meningitis. Signs of meningitis are not there. Instead of that, we have focal neurological deficit. It will depend which part of the brain parenchyma it has involved. Abscess can be in the brain parenchyma affecting the motor cortex. It can be in the cerebellum. It will then give you focal cerebellar signs, unilateral cerebellar signs or when if it is affecting the motor cortex then it will give you hemiparesis and however fever fever is present in only 50% of the cases of brain abscess not in all like I told you in bacterial meningitis, most of the patients, they do have fever, but in abscess, fever may or may not be present. This is 50-50. And focal or generalized seizure can occur in 15 to 35% of the patients. Aphasia, hemiparesis, as I told you, 
whatever region is involved, it will give you those signs. If the speech area is involved, patient may have aphasia, they may have any paresis, and if the occipital lobe is involved, they may have visual field defect, and cerebellar abscess will lead to nystagmus, ataxia, unilateral finger nose, test impairment, heel chin test impairment, difficulty in walking, and signs of phrase ICP can be there, like epiletema, nausea, vomiting, altered level of consciousness, and unilateral or bilateral six nerve palsy. These all can be there. The diagnosis is made by neuroimaging and contrast enhanced images they show in enhancing lesion and MRI is more sensitive. Even CT can be used where MRI is not available. Number puncture should not be performed in these patients. This is the MRI brain of a patient with brain abscess which is showing this ring enhancing lesion. This is brain abscess. And the management consists of optimal therapy. It involves a combination of high dose parenteral antibiotics and neurosurgical drainage. If cerebritis, if the patient has uh, is still the initial stage, that is cerebritis, we treat it with parenteral antibiotic, and that is a prolonged therapy for six to eight weeks, not like 10 to 14 days in meningitis. We may give patients uh, prophylactic anti epileptic drugs. These patients are prone to seizures and Many of them have seizures at presentation. The steroids should not be given until and unless there is significant perilesional edema or midline shift or otherwise the steroids are avoided. Now the separative thrombophlebitis. Separative intracranial thrombophlebitis, it is a septic venous thrombosis of cortical veins or sinuses. Cortical veins may be involved, pleural venous sinuses can be involved and sometimes both can be involved. It can occur as a complication of bacterial meningitis or cranial epidural abscess. Septic thrombosis of superior cerebral sinus presents with headache, fever, nausea, vomiting, focal or generalized seizures, and it can lead to bilateral lower limb weakness because this parasitical area is involved. Parasitical is medial frontal lobes. If these are involved bilaterally, what happens? There will be bilateral lower limb weakness and there will be extensive planters. Patient may be in altered state of consciousness. Then uh, we have septic cavernous sinus thrombosis also. Now, you, as if you remember your neuroanatomy, you should remember the structures that are present in the cavernous sinus, third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve, and first division of fifth cranial nerve. The patient will have sinus symptoms like fever, headache, frontal orbital pain, and they may have third, fourth, sixth, and the first division of fifth cranial nerve abnormalities on examination. Management consists of antibiotics, hydration, and removal of the infected tissue or thrombus. Infected tissue like patient may have otitis media or mastoiditis, or they may need surgical debridement of the primary source of infection, mastoidectomy, and uh, then treatment is continued for six weeks. Again, the treatment is prolonged. Yeah, hope you got it. Uh, then we come to amoebic meningoencephalitis. Now, this is different. This is neither a bacteria, neither it is a virus. It is a protozoa. It is a living, free living amoeba, which is the name is uh, microbiological name is Neglaria fowleri. And it was necessary to describe this in acute CNS infection. It is an acute fulminant disease, which is usually seen in children and young adults with recent exposure to fresh water. And patients are present with the uh, meningeal irritation that progress to encephalitis in death and it has very apoplectic onset and patients they usually die within uh, two to three days one to two days even and the onset is very sudden with the fever and loss of consciousness rare cures have been reported with IV and intraventricular amphotericin B and sometimes azithromycin also have been tried the one is antibacterial and this amphotericin is antifungal, but these are all empirical treatments and experimental treatments. And mortality is very high, it's, it's more than 95%. This is Nicolaria fowleri. Okay, then comes poliomyelitis. It's not a very typical uh, virus for causing encephalitis and uh, um, meningitis, but as we are getting the cases in Pakistan, though it is eradicated all over the world, I thought it is necessary to mention about poliomyelitis. It is caused by an enterovirus. It comes from the family of enteroviruses. It is highly contagious through the fecal oral route. And in 95% of the patients, the infection are asymptomatic. 
Symptomatic patients, they may present with one of the following syndromes, either with abortive polio, the symptoms are fever, headache, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and a sore throat, and that's it. They may have non-paralytic polio, they may uh, have meningeal irritation signs, and there will be absence of brain paralysis, this will be like aseptic meningitis. And then they can have typical paralytic polio. The diagnosis is mainly clinical, and the virus can be recovered from throat washings if early and stools in early and late both courses. Neutralizing antibodies can be found during the first and second week of the illness. Treatment is basically supportive. There is no particular antiviral drug which is effective for polymyelitis, and patients are advised with that as physiotherapy, and some of them they recover motor function after physiotherapy if there is paralytic polio. Now, epidural abscess, and here I'm talking about the spinal epidural abscess, so epidural abscess can occur in the brain as well, and it can occur in the spine as well. So here we would be basically talking about epidural abscess of the spine, though this topic probably will be dealt by the neurosurgeon, but uh, I thought to include it here as well. The risk factors for IV drug abusers, recent spinal or epidural anesthesia, and systemic infection. Again, systemic infection can be pneumonia, it can be infective endocarditis, more common with infective endocarditis because there are septic emboli that can lodge anywhere. And clinical features include back pain, fever, and focal neurological deficit, depending upon the site of the spine which is involved. If there is dorsal cord involved, there will be lower limb weakness, that is paraparesis or paraplegia, and if there is cervical cord involvement, there will be quadriparesis or quadri. Uh, plagia depending on the extent of the cord compression. All the IV drug abusers who have backache, they should be considered infectious until proven otherwise. They may or may not have fever. Osteomyelitis is a diagnosis in them and second is epidural abscess. The diagnosis is done basically on neuroimaging but we need to get all the baseline lab done, all the inflammatory markers done like the CRPs and ESR we need to get blood culture done and sometimes if it is positive, it can guide us for the proper antibiotic therapy. Treatment is basically a surgical debridement by a neurosurgeon and antibiotic coverage is given as third generation cephalosporins with metamidazole for anaerobic coverage. 